Hidden away in a small corner of rural Gloucestershire is a garden which has achieved celebrity status. You can travel anywhere in the world as a gardener and talk about the garden at Hidcote and suddenly people understand what you're talking about. Hidcote is unique and so unconventional that it influenced the development of English landscape design. Well, it's like any great garden. It, tra it transports you to another world and you realise that it is a touch of genius. But the man who devoted his life to creating this archetypal English country garden, Lawrence Johnston, was in fact a lonely, eccentric American with a secretive and tormented personal life. I would have thought there was a falling out as to how vocal and how violent we shall never know. In this film, we unravel Hidcote's extraordinary creation over a century ago, from a muddy field on a drafty hilltop to a stunningly lavish garden which, after a recent restoration, has become recognised as one of the greatest and most inspiring of all time. Hidcote is the jewel in the National Trust crown. This was the first property the Trust acquired in 1948, specifically for the garden alone, because of its great horticultural importance. The garden lies just outside the town of Chipping Camden in the Cotswolds. Despite its secluded location, it attracts people from all over the world who come to see the unique design and constant displays of colour all through the year. Hidcote is a great source of inspiration to many visitors. Sir Roy Strong, the eminent historian, came here in 1974, just as he was about to design and build his own garden in Herefordshire. Sir Roy's winter visit made a huge impression. It was a complete revelation to me. Bright blue sky, sun falling onto the frost and that wonderful winter magical sort of day. And of course there weren't any flowers here. But what it taught me immediately was the fundamental thing about making a garden. A good garden depends on how you orchestrate the terrain. And everywhere I turned here, I gasped with excitement about the variation in the size and the shape of the rooms, the sense of vista and surprise, the, of taking somebody up, and then you're looking at the Cotswold landscape beyond and the thrill of it, and turning a corner and, and Topri I fell in love with. All these things orchestrated suddenly you are in a completely magic land. Garden designer Chris Beardshaw was completely captivated when he first visited Hidcote, when he was just eight years old. I came here with my parents who had just got a National Trust membership so I was dragged along. I won't say kicking and screaming, but I was certainly dragged along. And it was one of those moments where my experience of horticulture prior to that suddenly started to make sense. And that for me was confirmation that I didn't want to do anything else in life. I wanted to garden, I wanted to be around gardeners, and I wanted to work with plants. What makes Hidcote very different from other gardens is its unconventional layout. The entire garden can never be seen in one view. Instead, you're taken on a journey through corridors of hedge that pass through a number of discreet cottage garden rooms. Hidcote's head gardener, Glyn Jones, thinks its unique design and size is at the heart of the garden's success. I think people relate to Hidcote because, although it is a garden 
10 and a half acres in size with at least 28 separate garden areas. You can break it down into pieces and people can relate to a section of the garden, whereas they might not relate to the whole thing because it's beyond anybody's wildest dreams, but you can relate to a small section of it and you can take that away with you when you visit Hidcat and be inspired to go and create something at home. As well as variety in the shapes and sizes of the rooms, the formal architecture is softened with plants that flower at different times, providing colour throughout the seasons. In terms of garden making, it's not that vast, and that, that is why it retains this absolutely hypnotic appeal. People can actually still relate to it. Whereas if you go to one of the really great stately home gardens, it's, it's beyond comprehension. It's seen as the archetypal English garden. It's how the English garden, as far as the rest of the world are concerned, it's much copied and mimicked. The irony, of course, is that it's not at all an English garden. It's a garden laid out by an American who was brought up in France and yet it sits at the heart of the English establishment. Hidcote's creator, Lawrence Johnston, was born in 1871. His parents were very wealthy Americans. His twice-widowed mother, Gertrude, was a socialite with a firm control over her son's ambitions. Johnston was brought up in France, but came to Cambridge to study history at Trinity College. In 1900, he became a British citizen and promptly joined the army to fight in the Boer War. But seven years later, Johnston's mother embarked on a plan to turn her son into an eligible gentleman farmer. The details of an estate in a small Gloucestershire village caught her eye. The 17th century property came with nearly 300 acres of farmland a small walled garden, and a dozen or so cottages. The purchase of Hidcote Manor satisfied Gertrude's ambition to launch her son into English society. They bought themselves into being minor landed gentry. I mean, let's face it, uh, they're not up to the level of the Astors, so they're rather down the line. But it gave them status still. Land, farm, village, everything came with it. But contrary to his mother's wishes, and much to her frustration, Johnson embarked on a plan to use the fields around the manor house for something far more ambitious, to build a garden. When Johnson first encountered this space, he must have wondered what on earth he was going to do with it. And, and there's no doubt that Mrs. Winthrop wanted him to be a gentleman farmer. She certainly didn't have notions of him being a gardener or laying out a grand garden. Johnson's plan was foolhardy. With no previous gardening experience, he hadn't considered Hidcote's harsh location. It was an absolutely ridiculous position to build a garden. We're at 600 feet in the North Cotswolds. We're in the rain shadow of the Cotswolds Scarp. We're very, very exposed. The wind howls across the Vale of Evesham in the winter and it can blow you sideways if you're not careful. So, yeah, so who in his right mind would build a garden here? That was the least of his worries. He still had to come up with a design. But at the time he sought inspiration, the gardening world was split by a public debate dubbed the Battle of the Styles. Two opposing camps came to blows in a bid to define a new national style for garden design. One camp argued for formal gardens with heavy structured architecture. While on the other hand, a case was made for a more unregimented, wild, naturalistic garden, dominated by random planting.
Johnson had the unique idea of fusing both styles, and he set about creating what became described as a wild garden in a formal setting. But establishing exactly how Johnson set about turning his ideas into reality has proved difficult. The documentary records on this garden are very, very few. I mean, we don't know the surviving plant lists. And we have no year-by-year -year account of the garden growing at all. So in that sense, uh, it's a complete mystery. So when the National Trust took on Hidcote over 60 years ago, Maintaining the garden in its original form was challenging and costly. The garden was simplified and lost much of Johnston's unique vision and spirit. Today, after a three and a half million pound 10 year restoration, Hidgut has almost been restored to its former glory as Johnston originally intended. But to complete the project, more work is being done to uncover further evidence of the garden's early development. It's become my personal mission at Hidcote to discover as much as we possibly can about what this garden was like in its heyday in order for us to interpret it for our many visitors because, you know, this is a grade one listed garden. It's absolutely unique. You know, for plants that are hardy in the British Isles, this has inspired so many people over the last kind of 70, 80 years and it's important we continue to do that. Part of Glynn's detective work is tracking down the last few surviving people who remember Johnston, like his godson. My parents used to go and stay with, with Johnny Johnston every summer for a fortnight. And there he is with my mother having his picnic. Oh, wow. This is an image, we've never seen this before. In order to interpret the garden, I believe very strongly that, you know, you've almost got to put yourself in Johnston's boots and, you know, and, you know, get out there and grow the range of plants, have the same planting policies as he had. With the limited evidence available, Glynn is slowly turning the clock back by reinstating the types of plants that Johnston first used. This is one of my favourites. I'll pluck it. This is it's a Dianthus Mrs. Simpkins. It's a beautiful old-fashioned pink, um, but the perfume is of cloves. It's got a very, very kind of spicy uh, perfume to it. But I just love that. That kind of to me that says kind of 1920s, 1930s. What a flower! What a Dianthus would have looked like in that period. <laughs> When Johnson started creating the garden, there was little to suggest that one day it would be so iconic. Uh, when the property was purchased in 1907, there was no garden as such here. There was a small garden within the confines of those beautiful stone and brick walls, which we now call the old garden. Maybe in the early days he was very cautious. You know, he was new to horticulture. He'd, you know, he was moving slowly, cautiously, building on his skills and his knowledge. He started very hesitantly with little things around the house, and then at some stage, and I can only speak from my own experience, suddenly you become hooked. I can remember when we bought the lasket, I said to my wife, don't talk to me about that garden. Well, there really wasn't one. But within a fortnight, I put Wellington boots on. I became positively obsessed by it and have been ever since. And I think something similar happened to him. Johnson became addicted. It was the start of an obsession which his mother would need deep pockets to fund and would eventually drive them apart. And although he went on to create a visionary garden which broke rules and established a new style, he started more conventionally. This is one of the first parts of Hidcote, as Johnson had laid it out. It's where Johnson was really testing himself against the climate. Of course, we're in the confines of the old walled garden, so it was quite a, quite a sedate area to start gardening in. And, and 
in a way, the, the muted colours and the control, the topiary, all of those are Johnson starting to form his opinion of how Hidcote may eventually be. He wanted that old English look, so he bought topiary, and you could buy topiary then. I mean, the early photographs show uh, U-pyramids with little birdies sitting on the top and all that sort of thing. Well, if you had a checkbook like he did, I, it's instant. But Johnston wasn't content to stop here. He was on a roll and set about expanding the garden and spending more of his mother's money. He pushed out beyond the confines of the old walls, creating two more low-lying terraces. One with formal box-edged beds overflowing with dwarf fuchsias is still just the same a hundred years on. Then, down a few more steps, he created a pool, which in later years he redesigned so it could be used for bathing. In just a few years, Johnston's abilities as a garden designer were evident. Johnston's art of being able to lead someone into a space, tease you with a view, and then tempt you off in tangential directions, and you end up dithering, thinking, do I go this way, or to my original, or this way, or back where I came from? And that's all part of the garden. It's that sense of drama, that sense of adventure. The success of Hidcut depends on a brilliant mastery of the terrain. The manipulation of the terrain is, 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 is I think, second to none. That is why it retains this absolutely hypnotic appeal. But I can't think of anybody who responded to the terrain in such an absolutely brilliant way in getting the architecture right almost from the beginning. One of the most amazing things as well is uh, in September and there is a period of about one week where the sun sets absolute plumb bob center in the middle of Heaven's Gate. It's moments like that that you just realise what a genius Lawrence Johnston was, because those things aren't accidents. That's the work of a genius. Hidcote's position might have afforded great views, but the garden was on a hill and very exposed to all weathers. Johnston protected his plants by cleverly planting hedges for shelter, over four and a half miles of them. It was enough in the early days for the gardeners to keep on top of the cutting. But even today, it takes the entire team over six months. Johnston's confidence in the garden was evident. His hedges provided both shelter and structure. But his special skill was the way he softened the formality with a natural style of informal planting. But Johnston's mother, Gertrude, was losing patience with her son's obsession the garden was costing her a fortune. There would be those who would have looked around at the time and said, well, why on earth are you wasting your money? Mrs. Winthrop, of course, felt that he was wasting his money and that he was squandering the wealth that she and her husbands had generated. And she was very anti this notion, this rather sort of superfluous appendage to the house. Well, they're two enigmatic people, aren't they? Mother and son. The mother clearly 
by the photograph, extremely dominant. And probably there was a there must have been an enormous amount of tension there and also a kind of desire to make a statement apart from her. It may well be that the garden is an expression to get out of the house and leave her stuck in the house when she was old and tottery and he can get out with the gardeners away from this crone. I would have thought there was a falling out as to how vocal and how violent and uh, you know how disagreeable that falling out was. We shall never know. Gertrude decided to stop her son's spending and put Hidcott up for sale. It looked likely that Johnson's creation so far was all in vain. But in the end, it wasn't Johnson's mother who put a halt to his gardening obsession, but something far more sinister. The First World War had broken out, and Johnston had to abandon his garden. In 1914, he sailed for Belgium with his regiment. Within weeks, he was fighting for his life at Ypres. In the First World War, I had a cataclysmic effect, because not only were the people really not in a good state when the war broke out, uh, but also the great houses were taken over as hospitals. Uh, there was conscription, so you suddenly found all the male servants went. I mean, the women would be left, but even they went into the, into the factories. So the, it was a complete dissolution of a society. Also, the gardens were dug up. Vegetables were needed. The population had to be fed. It was the end of something. It was the absolute end of aristocratic life as it, as it really had been known for 200 years. But in October 1914, Major Johnston was among the one and a half million casualties in the First Battle of Ypres. He'd been shot up in France, uh, left for dead on the battlefield. He was collected by the, uh, by the porters, left on a pile for burial in a mass grave. Um, but one of the, the officers that was in charge of the burial parties spotted a flicker of movement in Johnston. So obviously he was rushed to the, to the military hospital and you know he was kind of brought back from the dead. Thankfully, not only did Johnston survive his horrendous injuries, but his mother had a change of heart and decided not to sell Hidcote. Johnston was sent home to convalesce at the King Edward VII Hospital in London, very close to the Royal Horticultural Society Lindley Library. It presented him with the perfect opportunity to turn his thoughts back to his unfinished garden at Hidcote. Glynn has come to see the very books that Johnston was reading for inspiration in 1915. The library holds one of the most extensive ranges of rare horticultural books in the world, some dating back hundreds of years. They'll have to de they return. Proof of Johnston's research is plainly evident in the library's loan register. On this page here is a signature that I'm very familiar with, L. Johnston. This is, you know, absolute evidence that, you know, of the books he was reading and the books he was being inspired, inspired by almost a hundred years ago when he was, you know, at that critical time of laying out the garden at Hidka and, you know, this, these were partly his inspiration, so fantastic to, to be here probably maybe in the same building reading the same books as he was. From the long list of books that Johnston was reading in his sickbed, there is one that's caught Glynn's eye. Thomas Mawson's The Art and Craft of Garden Making was published in 1900. I think Mawson, Thomas Mawson, is the biggest influence on Johnston and on Hidcutt. Uh, there's one passage here which I think encapsulates Hidcutt uh, quite, quite well, actually. It's, and it says, the arrangements should suggest a series of apartments rather than a panorama which can be grasped in one view. And that's really interesting because Hidcote is 
a journey. It, you can't see it from one spot anywhere in the garden. You've got to get into the garden. You've got to travel through it in order to get a feeling for it, to understand it and, and just to enjoy it. And I think that passage really does you know, encapsulate what Hidcat is all about. Johnston's skill was to take these themes, distill the best elements down, and then shrink them to a manageable scale within his garden. This isn't a garden which copies other gardens. There are suggestions of others, but actually this is really quite pure. At the end of the First World War, Johnston's elderly mother was in poor health and chose to spend her time in the south of France leaving her son free to return to his garden. It was the start of a crucial period in Hidcott's development. And it's really only after he comes out of active service, he's, he's retired uh, army officer uh, with an abundant income, and he turns his attention to garden making at Hidcott on a, on a quite substantial scale. Up till now, Johnston had relied on a local source of unskilled labour. But given his ambitions for the garden, he now needed professional help to turn his plans into reality. In the 1920s, I think the main shift in this garden was that Johnston was given the confidence to start to garden, to start to design, to start to express himself. And that confidence came, I think, largely from one individual. Johnston employed Frank Adams as his first head gardener. Adams had worked at Windsor Castle for King George V, qualifications which no doubt impressed his new employer. At that point, there seems to be a huge gear shift in the way that the garden developed. It's much more ambitious. It's a much more integral design. There's more integrity to the whole structure, a cohesion between the spaces. So perhaps those abstract, somewhat whimsical, theatrical thoughts that Johnson was well known for were made real. The horticulture was dragged into them by Adam. Johnston was probably the, the, the inspiration, the, the man that came up with the big ideas for the structure and the design. Um, but I think Adams was the horticulturist, was the gardener. He was refining the garden. He was making the garden from being a great garden to being an outstanding garden. Adams had the practical knowledge to help Johnston realise his flashes of inspiration. This area of the garden is the great exploration of horticulture that Lawrence Johnson was trying to get at. This is about one man's love with his horticulture and with his plant material. So Adams, I think, injects the notion of cohesion, of fine horticulture, and of romance and theater. Their working relationship was horticultural symmetry. By the mid-twenties, Johnston's domineering mother was nearly 80, spending all her time on the French Riviera, where she eventually died. Her death was expected, but Johnston was shocked to discover that in her will, he was cut from inheriting any of her immense capital, only to receive an allowance, which nevertheless left him a very wealthy man. There must have been a big divide there at some, at, at some point. Something which reflects that divide is the fact that she ring-fenced, ring-fenced the Johnston capital so that he could not get his hands on it. Johnston on the surface appeared to have everything a hefty income, status, and an exceptional garden, which by the early 30s had gained recognition and was open to the public two or three days a year. But Johnson didn't enjoy the attention. He was a solitary character. One of the reasons this garden exists as it does today, one of the reasons that it is, is such an extraordinary piece of work, is because Johnson was so dysfunctional as an individual. 
in terms of his relationships, in terms of bonding with individuals, his dogs were about the closest thing he came to. And I think that really does explain an aspect of his character. He was happier with animals, and they must have given him the love and affection, which he probably didn't get from his mother, who looked like an old battle axe, uh, and didn't really get from anybody else. I think Johnston has been described as a closed book. He only associated with people that I think he felt were worthy of his company. And I think when you walk around the garden, the, the design of the garden reflects that as well because it's a very inward-looking garden. You can't see beyond the high hedges, so you're forced to study the design and to study the plants that grow within this kind of design landscape. It's kind of not embracing the wider, the wider world beyond the confines of the garden. The garden is all that's important in his life at that moment in time. Despite his eligibility, Johnston was still single, and this inevitably led to speculation. I mean, he may well have been completely asexual, and really no interest either way. Who knows whether he sort of popped down to the dockside and picked up a sailor, I don't know. I mean, in that period to be gay, in the aftermath of the Oscar Wilde incident. I mean, people might have known, but it would never be referred to, and it would certainly be regarded as beyond the pale within the establishment classes. Johnson was, however, close to one female companion, Nora Lindsay, a well-respected garden designer who enjoyed a lavish lifestyle at her Oxfordshire manor house. Nora and Johnston shared a love of all things horticultural. She offered advice and support as Hidcote was developing. But their friendship led to gossip that Nora's daughter Nancy was in fact Johnston's love child. A rumour strenuously denied. If he had been able to forge strong relationships and had had family and had had an extended social network, perhaps his attention wouldn't have been quite as focused on the garden. We wouldn't have got the delivery of the product that we have today. Johnson's multifaceted personality has revealed a multifaceted garden which has broad appeal. It's a perfect piece of work. The garden was the marriage and the family he never had. It was a kind of substitute. Um, and I see nothing wrong with that. Johnson was very selective in his friendships, mainly preferring the company of other well-connected gardening enthusiasts, like Mark Fenwick, who'd created his own highly regarded garden, Abbotswood, near Stowe-on-the-Wold. Fenwick used his influence among his high society chums to get Johnston elected a member of an elite gardening club. Well, the Garden Society was founded in 1920. It's a male society. Um, the only female that's ever been allowed to be elected to the Garden Society is the Queen Mother. So I think that gives the flavour of it. It's, it's a group of people who are basically... I suppose the equivalent of landed gentry. They have estates and means to maintain quite substantial gardens. It would have given him state, the sort of status that he desired. He would be accepted in the gardening equivalent of being elected to Boodles or Whites or one of the smarter upmarket London men's clubs. This cosy club of titled wealthy gardeners gave Johnston an opportunity to flex his horticultural muscles. He wanted the best possible plants for his garden and he was prepared to travel all the way around the world to collect these or to send people all the way around the world to collect them on his behalf. But what was important, I'm sure, to him was that he had better plants than Fenwick down at Abbotsford and it was kind of keeping up with the Joneses, I think. 
Johnston became obsessed with acquiring newly discovered and rare plants, and at a time when plant hunting was at its peak. It was a period, I suppose, when we were able to harvest the best from the imperial, the empire. That we, we are dragging ideas in, we're bringing plants in. We're very eclectic in our thoughts. And it's difficult to imagine Johnson creating Hidcote in any other time than in the 1920s, because it was such a vibrant period. Johnston's wealth enabled him to sponsor and travel on a number of plant hunting expeditions all over the world. On one trip to South Africa, he even took his cook and butler. Johnson's plant hunting trips, uh, they fall into two categories, I suppose. Those which genuinely contributed something and those which were a little bit of a horticultural jolly, one suspects. Certainly as, from a plant hunter's perspective, he wasn't hugely respected or, or even wanted on those expeditions. But these trips gave Johnston a mass of new exotic varieties, which he planted back at Hidcote in areas like the Rock Garden. This one area of the garden is coming to the end of a major restoration. This was a special rock garden. It was, you know, it was the, the creme de la creme of private rock gardens in the British Isles. Glyn and his deputy, Vicky, want to find out exactly what varieties Johnston planted here when the rock garden was first created. But most of the records have been lost or destroyed, and there are only a few photographs, so they have to play plant detectives. There's just little tidbits to go on, so it just makes it in, in the way. It makes you sort of more curious to find mm. out more and, and go rummaging for fi to find more information. The one place that might have some clues is the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Here they have records dating back hundreds of years, which document the plant hunting trips Johnston took part in, like an ill-fated expedition to Yunnan province in China where Johnston joined the highly respected botanist George Forrest, the Indiana Jones of the plant world. Yeah, I mean, the journey they undertook was just immense, really. I mean, just getting there would have taken weeks, if not months. Forrest led the expedition, which by all accounts was fraught with danger, often disguising himself as a local. You know, he didn't even have waterproof clothing, and it, and it does rain a lot when you're up in the mountains, and there would have been no vaccines. Mm. And I just wonder, you know, how often was he ill, or was he just so hardy mm. that he was exposed to everything and he didn't become ill? George Forrest bitterly regretted allowing Johnston to join the Chinese expedition. The Botanic Gardens archivist, Graham Hardy, has found Forrest's original letters of complaint sent back to a colleague at Edinburgh. On the base of the first page, this is what he writes. Had I raked GB, that's Great Britain, with a small tooth comb, I couldn't have found a worse companion than Johnson. And I can't say how often during the past three months I have cursed myself for being so foolish in consenting to him accompanying me. I have indeed paid for my folly. A person more utterly selfish I have yet to meet, and I'm not the only one here who thinks so, for none like him. Johnston was used to travelling in style and comfort, and it was this that had no doubt triggered Forrest's outbursts. In spite of the bickering, they amassed a collection of new plants and seeds, all of which were recorded and compiled in the Edinburgh archives. So, I mean, any other information on these trips, expeditions, right. if, if there's anything known, would be really quite interesting. Well, as I see, these records list in detail every type of seed and plant collected on Johnston's expedition and where they were distributed. Aquilegia alpina, you've got that on the rock yeah. garden now. We've got that one. We were aware that Edinburgh was sending out seeds and plants and cuttings, but you don't realise, actually, 
how many seeds and how many cuttings until you look through the records and to how many people and it was all over the world and it was you know his botanic gardens and it was and it was private people that had a lot of money. Lots and lots of them we need to Glyn and Vicky hope these books will hold the key to revealing which plants Johnston was collecting so they can reinstate the same varieties in the rock garden back at Hidcote. Ah, interesting. We've come across one entry here, 1949, which we don't seem to have documented in our, in, in our kind of survey documents. So these are all plants. This is quite exciting, really, because none of these plants we've ever known to have been grown at Hidcote in the past. So, again, it's a, it's a new shopping list for us to start trawling through and to see, you know, if any of these plants will fit in the garden today with some of the projects that we're doing. So any of those numbers there that refer to potentially subalpine or alpine material with the east bank of the rock garden, there's, you know, there's plants there that we can trial and grow on that area to see how they, how they survive. Can we stop here all weekend, just cross-referencing these numbers? <laughs> Johnston might not have been a popular travelling companion, but his involvement did have benefits. But there's no doubt that the purse he was able to provide facilitated the introduction of huge numbers of very, very garden-worthy plants. Plants which we still enjoy at the heart of our gardens today. Johnston had collected a wealth of new plant material which he packed into the garden. Still a bit of colour around to Today, Hidcote is home to over 4,000 species and Glyn has to make sure all the garden team's plant knowledge is up to scratch. Uh, big dahlia as well at the background there, that's one of my favourites. Including the apprentice known by the team as Scouse John. Right, John, in Winthrop's here we've got a plant that's incredibly important to our collection at Hidcote. This yellow flowered one here. Now I would I hope you know this one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, well done. It is, that's so important to Hidcote because it's one of the plants that uh, Johnston selected as of being of great garden merit. Um, you know, almost every garden in the country now has probably got a high pericum Hidcote. Anything you know about this one? Uh, is this a stubby? No, it's not. It's, it's from New Zealand. It's a, a southern hemisphere plant. Um, this one, it's a hebe, and it's one that is called hidka, hebe hidka. Oh, really? So it's a lovely one, and you can see there's lots of different colours on it. It comes, you know, when the flowers first emerge, it's this lovely kind of lilac-y blue, yeah. but they fade all the way through to white, you see. Oh, okay. So it goes all the way through that transition, and it's a bomb-proof plant. You can do anything with it. You can prune it almost off to your ankles and it will always come back again. You can grow it high. It's evergreen, lovely kind of, you know, lush foliage on it. And it probably starts flowering in May and it goes right the way through until the middle of winter. It's a great, great value plant again. It's just, it's just absolutely awe-inspiring. Um, every day you, you're constantly rewarded, for, you know, the plants, the, 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 the hard landscaping, like the hedges and the gazebos and all the different bits. It's just, it's, it's just so inspiring and so, so beautiful. Now, lace caps, hydrangeas produce male and female flowers. When the female flowers are young, they're upright like that, kind of like saucers, waiting to collect the pollen, to be pollinated. And then once the female flower has been pollinated, do you know what she does to the male? Throw a wild guess and see she turns her back on him. <laughs> <laughs> she does. Yeah, she absolutely. Look, you can see she's once she once she's pollinated, she turns upside down. So you see this one here, not yet been pollinated, so she's upright expecting pollen. But these older flowers here that were kind of born a, a few weeks earlier, she's turned her back on the male. But I love stories like that. It's kind of sexual encounters of the floral kinds. <laughs> at, at this stage you know, of, of my knowledge of gardens, this is the best garden I've ever been to or, or know about. Um, and so, so to be training here, it's, it's, just, it's just fantastic. Some less hardy varieties that Johnston collected needed protection from the Gloucestershire frosts so he specially built a plant house. After the Second World War, it became dilapidated and was eventually demolished.
but using rare photographs taken back in the 30s as reference, the plant house has now been faithfully rebuilt to exactly how it was in Johnston's day. <laughs> Come on, you got to do your best now, Jazz. <laughs> so I think you'd be proud that we've actually put the original building back and we've respected the, you know, the history and the design of the original building. Today, the plant house is being opened by gardening celebrity Roy Lancaster. This is for Hidcott and Lawrence Johnson. <laughs> hey, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Never have I seen anything quite like this outside of a botanic garden. Uh, this wonderful structure here is absolutely superb. I can well believe that if uh, Johnson was to walk in at the back of this group tonight and look from a distance, he would be happy to see some of the plants that he originally put in here uh, still growing on the wall. Uh, I'd like to just walk around... Johnson's problem was that there simply wasn't the space or the right climate for some of his subtropical collections. But he had the perfect solution. Every autumn, Johnson would leave Hidcote in his chauffeured Bentley and drive down to the sun-kissed French Riviera at Monton, spending the winter months in his secluded villa, Serre de la Madone. Johnson bought the property in the 1920s and built the garden from scratch over a 25-year period. The favourable climate was perfect for a whole range of exotic plants he'd collected on his trips that would never have survived the colder English weather. Glynn has come over to France as he thinks it holds the key to finding out more about Johnston's elusive character. This place is so important to round a circle in the life of Lawrence Johnston. There are even surviving specimens in the garden dating back 80 years. Uh, it's a banksia, this wonderful southern hemisphere uh, shrub tree which has these magnificent kind of soft lemon yellow flowers which once they're faded you get almost like pine cones, fruiting bodies, which when a forest fire comes through, they get baked and the seed is disseminated onto, onto clean virgin ground from which they germinate and new ones are born. I think this plant uh, kind of typifies just why it was important that uh, Major Johnston got a garden down here in the south of France because it was a canvas on which he could grow all these magnificent and very unusual tender plants outdoors with, without any heat. It really is a a plantsman's playground, one of which you can spoil yourself totally in. Johnston employed 23 staff at the villa, including 11 gardeners. Martin Smith, president of the Monton Garden Society, is taking Glynn to meet the last member of Johnston's staff still alive. Frida Bottin looked after Johnston in his later life. He's very here and very old. Her father, Alfredo, was Johnston's butler for 25 years. In, in your father's role working in, in the villa here, mm -hmm. what sort of tasks do you think he enjoyed doing the most? Uh, I don't know. He enjoyed to, be, to work for Mr Johnston. So Mr have... Johnston was for... You have, you have a great admiration for him. Frida got to know Johnston probably better than anyone else. He was shy, was very timid. He was timid and he begged a little bit. He was moment, he was very timid and reserved. You mentioned Major Johnston having lots of parties here. Oui. I mean, did he enjoy the parties? And no. He didn't? <laughs> no. Okay. Can you remember? He received by good education. But it embêtait. Un jour, he had received plusieurs persons. 
Et il a dit à mon père, « Oh, Fredo, je suis très embêté, je n'ai pas envie de parler à tous ces gens. Je vais dans le bois. Vous leur direz que j'ai mal à la tête et que je ne peux pas descendre. » Lui, il aimait son jardin. Voilà, le jardin. Tous ses amis supposaient qu'il était homo. Alors que c'est pas... Ça, ça m'a choqué. Mais c'est pas la vérité. By the 1950s, Johnston was showing signs of dementia. And Frida helped with his full-time care. J'ai des photos, d'ailleurs. là. Je, je les ai jamais montrées en... parce que c'est tellement misérable. Je vous les montrerai. Il est resté trois ans couché sans se lever. Hein. Ah, il était complètement... Ah oh, oui. On lui faisait du goutte à goutte pour le tenir réveillé. Voilà. Voilà M. Johnstone. Il y a quelques années après la mort de Johnston, il L'infirmière m'a appelé, me dit Venez voir Frida, je crois qu'il est, qu est mort. Il, fait, il était mort, j'ai fermé ses yeux. So, à, à, à peine il était mort, j'étais contente qu'il soit parti. Il souffrait tellement. Et après, on a su plus tard qu'il a laissé des milliards et des milliards. Ça a pris dix ans pour partager. Hein dix ans. Parce que M. Johnston avait donné à tous ses employés un million d'anciens francs. C'est bien. Euh, son plus grand regret, c'était de ne pas avoir un titre. Il s'appelait simplement Monsieur Johnston. Et il disait à mon père, vous voyez, Fredo, l'argent n'a aucune valeur, c'est d'abord les titres. I do feel like we know a lot more about his character now than we did just a, a few hours ago. I mean, the garden and the plants, I now believe, were the whole purpose to his life. You know, I guess the plants were his, were his friends and he can communicate better with the plants than he used to do with human beings. After Johnston died, the National Trust's challenge was to retain his vision and maintain the huge numbers of plants in the garden. How long have you been here? Uh, just over a year. OK. Uh, Some are very rare and Johnston is credited for personally introducing them into the UK and must be preserved. It's one of the, the plants that Johnston would have brought back from those plant hunting expeditions. Yeah. And have you taken cuttings from it before? No, Chris, I don't know. What you're looking for when you're taking cuttings is a non-flowering shoot. That's a good specimen there, in fact. You can just take out the right-hand stem if you can. That's it, perfect. So let's take it back to the bench and we'll okay. chop it up a little bit more. This is a plant that Lawrence would have handled himself. You know, Johnson would have probably, if not planted it, he would have positioned it and would have had a say in where it went in the garden. But of course, even better than that, he would have had a say in how it came to these shores in the first place. So it's, a, it, it's hugely important. On one hand, from a purely horticultural perspective, it's just a Mahonia cutting, but on the other hand, it's a piece of gardening history. You know, this is our gardening heritage, and what we're doing is, is propagating it to make sure that that heritage goes forward and, and, and is, is still there for, you know, my children and your children to, to, to be able to experience. But it's a, you've got such a wonderful opportunity working here. You can go anywhere in the world after you've finished your careership here and, and talk to people about Hidcut, and it, doors will open because you've trained at the best English garden. So I'm very envious, actually. You've got my perfect job. <laughs> Once Scouse John's apprenticeship ends, his dream is to get a full-time job with the rest of the gardening team at Hidcut. He's fitting in well, but the team has spotted an uncanny resemblance. <laughs> you look at him, and physically, he, he's the same height, He's the same kind of build. Uh, Johnston wore a moustache. This, they once say, slightly receding. John won't thank me for saying that, but he was. And there is a real, real resemblance between John and Johnston. And uh, the garden team make a bit of a joke out of it, actually. And we call him Young Johnny, so... <laughs>
Young Johnny not only looks like Johnston, but it turns out he's an Edwardian junkie. I'm interested in the whole the whole era really. Um, you know, the music, the gardens. Um, it's quite bizarre that I've, I've ended up working at um, you know a garden was created in that time, and uh, it's created. Lawrence Johnson was you know one of the, the big uh, garden creators of, of that of that era. <laughs> the rest of the staff, if you know, find it really bizarre. Uh, it's like you know, it's like a, Lawrence is coming back through the, through the medium of a, of a young scouser. Lawrence Johnston was buried alongside his mother in a village not far from Hidcote. His modest epitaph is simple. Gifted gardener and horticulturist, much loved by all his friends. He may not have had the good fortune to have the sort of relationship which one would expect a man to have fulfilled emotional and spiritual relationship with another human being. I think uh, that he would look down from above and get huge gratification about the fact that he had given it to everyone through his garden, through the miracle of creating this garden. It's a lovely legacy. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I think it would surprise him and he'd be rather shy about it, embarrassed. If Johnson was able to follow a coach party through Hidkit Manor, I think he'd be horrified. I think he'd be horrified not at the quality of the garden. I think he'd be horrified at the number of people who were visiting. This wasn't ever intended as a garden to take large visitor numbers. This was a garden laid out for one man. We're closer today to understanding Hidcote Manor than we've ever been. And the restoration has to continue in order for us to get the true picture of Johnson and his garden. And I think that, that hunger for knowledge and an understanding of who he was and where he came from and what inspired him um, will just keep us driving to learn as much as we can. And we're not naive about it. We'll never know everything. Because of it, it's because of uh, this man's creation. Um, you know, I've got, I've found a new life now. I'm destined to spend the rest of my days as a gardener. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't think of anything I'd rather be doing now than, than working at Hickett. Um It's, you know, it's absolutely incredible what what this man's creation has, has done to my life. Johnston's garden is now over a hundred years old. And although other gardens during that time have contributed to the development of new styles in garden design, it's Hidcote that's regarded as the model of inspiration all over the world. And though we don't fully understand the man that created it, Hidcote is held up as one of the greatest garden icons of the 20th century. We're roaming through another breathtaking arts and crafts garden here on BBC4 this week as the first in our brand new four-part series explores Great Dixter. British Gardens in Time starts on Tuesday at nine. Next this evening, though, scaling the Himalayas as we join Natural World on an epic wildlife adventure. Hidden away in a small corner of rural Gloucestershire, is a garden which has achieved celebrity status. You can travel anywhere in the world as a gardener and talk about the garden at Hidcote and suddenly people understand what you're talking about. Hidcote is unique and so unconventional that it influenced the development of English landscape design. Well, it's like any great garden. It, tra it transports you to another world and you realise that 
and is a touch of genius. But the man who devoted his life to creating this archetypal English country garden, Lawrence Johnston, was in fact a lonely, eccentric American with a secretive and tormented personal life. I would have thought there was a falling out as to how vocal and how violent we shall never know. In this film, we unravel Hidcote's extraordinary creation over a century ago, from a muddy field on a drafty hilltop to a stunningly lavish garden which, after a recent restoration, has become recognized as one of the greatest and most inspiring of all time. Hidcote is the jewel in the National Trust crown. This was the first property the Trust acquired in 1948, specifically for the garden alone, because of its great horticultural importance. The garden lies just outside the town of Chipping Camden in the Cotswolds. Despite its secluded location, it attracts people from all over the world who come to see the unique design and constant displays of colour all through the year. Hidcote is a great source of inspiration to many visitors. Sir Roy Strong, the eminent historian, came here in 1974, just as he was about to design and build his own garden in Herefordshire. Sir Roy's winter visit made a huge impression. It was a complete revelation to me. Bright blue sky, sun falling onto the frost and that wonderful winter magical sort of day. And of course there weren't any flowers here. But what it taught me immediately was the fundamental thing about making a garden. A good garden depends on how you orchestrate the terrain. And everywhere I turned here, I gasped with excitement about the variation in the size and the shape of the rooms, the sense of vista and surprise, the, of taking somebody up, and then you're looking at the Cotswold landscape beyond and the thrill of it, and turning a corner and, and topiary I fell in love with. All these things orchestrated suddenly you are in a completely magic land. Garden designer Chris Beardshaw was completely captivated when he first visited Hidgut, when he was just eight years old. I came here with my parents who had just got a National Trust membership so I was dragged along. I won't say kicking and screaming, but I was certainly dragged along. And it was one of those moments where my experience of horticulture prior to that suddenly started to make sense. And that for me was confirmation that I didn't want to do anything else in life. I wanted to garden, I wanted to be around gardeners, and I wanted to work with plants. What makes Hidcote very different from other gardens is its unconventional layout. The entire garden can never be seen in one view. Instead, you're taken on a journey through corridors of hedge that pass through a number of discreet cottage garden rooms. Hidcote's head gardener, Glyn Jones, thinks its unique design and size is at the heart of the garden's success. I think people relate to Hidkit because, although it is a garden 10 and a half acres in size with at least 28 separate garden areas, you can break it down into pieces and people can relate to a section of the garden, whereas they might not relate to the whole thing because it's beyond anybody's wildest dreams, but you can relate to a small section of it and you can take that away with you when you visit Hidka and be inspired to go and create something at home.
As well as variety in the shapes and sizes of the rooms, the formal architecture is softened with plants that flower at different times, providing colour throughout the seasons. In terms of garden making, it's not that vast, and that, that is why it retains this absolutely hypnotic appeal. People can actually still relate to it, whereas if you go to one of the really great stately home gardens, it's, it's beyond comprehension. It's seen as the archetypal English garden. It's how the English garden, as far as the rest of the world are concerned, it's much copied and mimicked. The irony, of course, is that it's not at all an English garden. It's a garden laid out by an American who was brought up in France. And yet it sits at the heart of the English establishment. Hidcote's creator, Lawrence Johnston, was born in 1871. His parents were very wealthy Americans. His twice widowed mother, Gertrude, was a socialite with a firm control over her son's ambitions. Johnston was brought up in France, but came to Cambridge to study history at Trinity College. In 1900, he became a British citizen and promptly joined the army to fight in the Boer War. But seven years later, Johnston's mother embarked on a plan to turn her son into an eligible gentleman farmer. The details of an estate in a small Gloucestershire village caught her eye. The 17th century property came with nearly 300 acres of farmland, a small walled garden, and a dozen or so cottages. The purchase of Hidcote Manor satisfied Gertrude's ambition to launch her son into English society. They bought themselves into being minor landed gentry. I mean, let's face it, uh, they're not up to the level of the Astors, so they're rather down the line. But it gave them status still. Land, farm, village, everything came with it. But contrary to his mother's wishes, and much to her frustration, Johnson embarked on a plan to use the fields around the manor house for something far more ambitious, to build a garden. When Johnson first encountered this space, he must have wondered what on earth he was going to do with it. And, and there's no doubt that Mrs. Winthrop wanted him to be a gentleman farmer. She certainly didn't have notions of him being a gardener or laying out a grand garden. Johnson's plan was foolhardy. With no previous gardening experience, he hadn't considered Hidcote's harsh location. It was an absolutely ridiculous position to build a garden. We're at 600 feet in the North Cotswolds. We're in the rain shadow of the Cotswolds Scarp. We're very, very exposed. The wind howls across the Vale of Evesham in the winter and it can blow you sideways if you're not careful. So yeah, so who in his right mind would build a garden here? That was the least of his worries. He still had to come up with a design. But at the time he sought inspiration, the gardening world was split by a public debate dubbed the Battle of the Styles. Two opposing camps came to blows in a bid to define a new national style for garden design. One camp argued for formal gardens with heavy structured architecture. While on the other hand, a case was made for a more unregimented, wild, naturalistic garden, dominated by random planting. Johnson had the unique idea of fusing both styles, and he set about creating what became described as a wild garden in a formal setting. But establishing exactly how Johnson set about turning his ideas into reality has proved difficult. The documentary records on this garden are very, very few. I mean, we don't know the surviving plant lists. 
And we have no year-by-year -year account of the garden growing at all. So in that sense, uh, it's a complete mystery. So when the National Trust took on Hidcote over 60 years ago, maintaining the garden in its original form was challenging and costly. The garden was simplified and lost much of Johnston's unique vision and spirit. Today, after a three and a half million pound, 10 year restoration, Hidgut has almost been restored to its former glory as Johnston originally intended. But to complete the project, more work is being done to uncover further evidence of the garden's early development. It's become my personal mission at Hidcote to discover as much as we possibly can about what this garden was like in its heyday in order for us to interpret it for our many visitors because, you know, this is a grade one listed garden. It's absolutely unique. You know, for plants that are hardy in the British Isles, this has inspired so many people over the last kind of 70, 80 years and it's important we continue to do that. Part of Glynn's detective work is tracking down the last few surviving people who remember Johnston, like his godson. My parents used to go and stay with, with Johnny Johnston every summer for a fortnight. And there he is with my mother having his picnic. Oh, wow. This is an image we've never seen this before. In order to interpret the garden, I believe very strongly that, you know, you've almost got to put yourself in Johnston's boots and, you know, and, you know, get out there and grow the range of plants, have the same planting policies as he had. With the limited evidence available, Glynn is slowly turning the clock back by reinstating the types of plants that Johnston first used. This is one of my favourites. I'll pluck it. This is it's a Dianthus Mrs. Simpkins. It's a beautiful old-fashioned pink, um, but the perfume is of cloves. It's got a very, very kind of spicy uh, perfume to it. But I just love that. That kind of to me that says kind of 1920s, 1930s. What a flower! What a Dianthus would have looked like in that period. When Johnson started creating the garden, there was little to suggest that one day it would be so iconic. When the property was purchased in 1907, there was no garden as such here. There was a small garden within the confines of those beautiful stone and brick walls, which we now call the old garden. Maybe in the early days he was very cautious. You know, he was new to horticulture. He'd, you know, he was moving slowly, cautiously, building on his skills and his knowledge. He started very hesitantly with little things around the house, and then at some stage, and I can only speak from my own experience, suddenly you become hooked. I can remember when we bought the lasket, I said to my wife, don't talk to me about that garden. Well, there really wasn't one. But within a fortnight, I put Wellington boots on. I became positively obsessed by it and have been ever since. And I think something similar happened to him. Johnson became addicted. It was the start of an obsession which his mother would need deep pockets to fund and would eventually drive them apart. And although he went on to create a visionary garden which broke rules and established a new style, he started more conventionally. This is one of the first parts of Hidcote, as Johnson had laid it out. It's where Johnson was really testing himself against the climate. Of course, we're in the confines of the old walled garden, so it was quite a quite a sedate area to start gardening in. And, and in a way, the, the muted colours and the control, the topiary, all of those are Johnson starting to form his opinion of how Hidcote may eventually be.
And he wanted that old English look, so he bought topiary, and you could buy topiary then. I mean, the early photographs show uh, a U pyramids with little birdies sitting on the top and all that sort of thing. Well, if you had a checkbook like he did, I, it's instant. But Johnston wasn't content to stop here. He was on a roll and set about expanding the garden and spending more of his mother's money. He pushed out beyond the confines of the old walls, creating two more low-lying terraces. One with formal box-edged beds overflowing with dwarf fuchsias is still just the same a hundred years on. Then, down a few more steps, he created a pool, which in later years he redesigned so it could be used for bathing. In just a few years, Johnston's abilities as a garden designer were evident. Johnston's art of being able to lead someone into a space, tease you with a view, and then tempt you off in tangential directions, and you end up dithering, thinking, do I go this way, or to my original, or this way, or back where I came from? And that's all part of the garden. It's that sense of drama, that sense of adventure. The success of Hidcote depends on a brilliant mastery of the terrain. The manipulation of the terrain is, 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 is I think, second to none. That is why it retains this absolutely hypnotic appeal. But I can't think of anybody who responded to the terrain in such an absolutely brilliant way in getting the architecture right almost from the beginning. One of the most amazing things as well is uh, in September, and there is a period of about one week where the sun sets absolute plumb bob centre in the middle of Heaven's Gate. 